What I was surprised by when I was doing the research is that not only did your success catch you off guard, you felt embarrassed by the success. Why? For years, for years, for years. Because I was going to be a big shot lawyer. Like, yeah, you're subverting the law. <laughs> well, maybe because the teenage textbook, it's a love story about teenagers. I mean, it's so trivial and it's humor. That wasn't the persona I wanted. When the books became famous, I was already graduating and I was becoming a pupil in a law firm, which meant that I was just one step away from practicing law. I had this very clear image in my mind that I was going to be Atticus Finch from To Kill a Mockingbird, or I would be some terrifying, overwhelming, intimidating lawyer, super smart, blah, blah, very serious. To be known as the writer of the teenage textbook is incongruous. So I would be like giving serious advice and meeting clients and telling them stuff. And then one of them would say, oh, you wrote the teenage textbook. I really like it. It was really funny. This part's really romantic. And I'm like, shut up in my mind, of course, because I don't have the guts to be confrontational. But in my heart, I'll be like, no, you're ruining it. Stop it. Let me be the fierce lawyer. Why must you mess everything up? So for decades, for decades, whenever I met clients, they would sometimes say to me, oh, I read your book when I was young. And I would just brush it off, which is very rude. Let me tell you, it's very the wrong Asian, thing to do. though. Very isn't Asian. It, isn't it? It is. You're absolutely right. We can't deal with compliments. We don't know how to be gracious. I mean, the correct thing to do, which is something I try and do nowadays, is to say, oh, that's very nice. And tell me more about it. What did you like? And so on. And in the past, I would never think of doing that because I would think I'm indulging myself. I'm like, oh, I'm such a great writer. I want you to talk more about how much you like my book. So I didn't want to be that person. And then I realized it wasn't really about me. If someone wants to talk about something, they had a good experience reading my book, then let them talk about it. They are recalling a time in their lives when they read something that I wrote and they appreciated it and it meant something to them. It's the kind of book that people read when they are just at the cusp of being an adult. So the readers who talk to me, they say, oh, I read this when I was 16, 17, when I met my first girlfriend, or when I was just going to pre-university, moving from an all-boys school or an all-girls school to a mixed school. And I read that. It made me have these experiences. They are talking not just about a book, but they're talking about a chapter in their lives when everything changed and everything was new. When they mentioned it to me, I should recognize that and I should appreciate that. Okay, I had something to do with that. Not intentional, but I'm glad that you remember it. Because when people see me, sometimes they remember 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Wow. When they see me, it's not because they know me. It's because they associate me with something they read when they were much younger. And they associate me with a time when life was innocent and all was, well. Nostalgia. <laughs> there is definitely a big tinge of nostalgia. I think it took me many decades to recognize that because for the longest time, all I thought of was myself. I thought, oh, don't talk about my book for crying out loud. Let's talk about the law. You're here to get some legal advice. It's only recently that, okay, we can talk about the law later, but you're having a moment to, to travel back to your childhood and I'll travel with you and we can talk about that for a while. What I thought was fascinating is that you've told us a lot that you are not a confrontational person. You will let it out through your writing, but then you became a litigator. The very nature of your bread and butter is to do disputes. And you've said before in an interview, you get very excited to smash the other side. So I'm trying to reconcile these two sides. How do they come into play? Who are you, Adrian? <laughs> well, that's a very good point. And I think a lot of litigators are like me in the sense that we channel our aggression, our antagonism through our litigation. So if you meet us socially, we'll be pleasant and polite and accommodating. But we need an outlet. And maybe we don't know the appropriate way to have an outlet in social settings. So litigation helps a lot. I liken it to actors. There are many actors who are introverts. In social settings, they find themselves being very awkward. 
not being very expressive. Then they go into acting or they go into stand-up comedy because when they put on that persona of a character or, or a comic, they can give that aspect of their character a chance to air itself, a voice, a moment. It's precisely because in their normal lives, they don't know how to fully function. So for me, in my normal life, I don't know how to be disagreeable. I'm quite sure I'm disagreeable, but not intentionally. I don't know how to argue and stand up for myself if I'm in my own situation. If the waiter ill-treats me, I'm the sort that will just sit in the corner and not fight back, even against a waiter. That's so strange though. Why? Uh, Even now? (laughs) That's why we all need an outlet. And I think a lot of litigators have an outlet for that challenging part of their character. They can go to court, they can stand up, they can openly accuse people of being liars and fraudsters and criminals. That's all fine. You can write whatever you like and that's okay. I guess one thing I always feel about Asian society, especially Singapore society, is that we don't have the vocabulary to argue. In the West, having a debate a discussion about topics. It can get quite heated, it can get quite detailed, but I feel that they have a grip on that sort of thing. They know how to argue stuff so that we can understand what the issues are and we can make up our minds. In Singapore, because I think we're Asian, part of the time when we want to disagree about something, we don't have the technique to disagree. First, we confuse being disagreeable or disagreeing with something to being rude or to being insulting. Let's say we're in a situation where there's some authority figure or someone in in power. So we're in a group setting, there's someone in an authority figure and he says something we don't agree with. In Singapore, in an Asian context, by and large, most of us would be like, oh, he said that. I don't think he's right. I'm not going to say anything though. Because if I say something, I'll be correcting him. He'll lose face and he'll be humiliated, blah, blah, blah. All that baggage. As a result, we tend not to deal with issues that well, or we take a longer time to resolve issues. What we need to learn in Singapore and in the Asian context is how to point stuff out to say, oh, you know what? You just said that. That's not correct. Actually, it should be this. Or you think it's this, but I think it's something different. And here are my reasons. We say that in a non-threatening way, in a courteous way, so that we talk about the issue and not spend our time nursing our wounded feelings. I don't know if Singapore will ever get there. But what I like from litigation is that I'm okay doing that. Litigators get to go to court. They get to disagree. They can say the judge is wrong. Their opponent is wrong. And the case is over. They're great friends with their opponents again. They go out for coffee with their opponents. That's how it should be. I wish more Singaporeans could be like that, to be honest. What was it like working with Devinder Singh? who's widely known as one of the top litigators in Singapore. He is, he is. I think he is the top litigator in Singapore. I think lawyers in Malaysia know of him as well. He was my boss for many years. I was a legal assistant. In those days, we call it a legal assistant. It's like an associate. I was in the IP department. One day, there was a file. There was a new matter. It was about two hotels with the same name. It didn't seem like a big case, but it turned out to be a big case. I started working on it. I was the main associate and I wrote the letter of demand, the pleadings, Alfred Davis client wanted the best lawyer in Singapore, which is Davinder Singh. Now at that time, I never worked with him. All I knew was that he's a super scary guy, very, very terrifying, but wow, a chance to work with him? Sure, okay. And then he took the case and he was number one on the case. Another partner, Dida Singh Gill, was number two. He's now a judge. I was number three. I think I was in charge of all the paperwork and dealing with clients. My point is that I was having a lot of interaction with the client, making the file, and then Davinder argued it, and he won. It was great. It was a famous victory. After that, he did more files with me. Maybe I should say I did more files with him. I worked through the night. I worked my butt off and it was a great success. I got more opportunities to work with him. And then I had a chance to become a partner and start my own team and do my own cases. All that would not have happened if I didn't have a chance to work with him in the first place. 
What do you think made your partnership with him so successful? I mean, some of the big cases you worked on, the National Kidney Foundation, Lee Kuan Yew, Lee Seng Hong, again, Singapore Democratic Party. There's a big, big, very public cases. Oh, I can't claim any credit. I mean, he wins a lot of cases and I get to... Write on the coattails. I like write on the coattails. I get to carry the bag. I get to sit next to him. I get to take the notes. And I sometimes think, yeah, the way I took notes during the trial, it would have swung the case. I think that was what the judge noticed, that apart from all that cross-examination and the fiery submissions, there was this associate sitting in the corner writing the notes. That was probably what swung it. I'm sure the closing submissions were very important too. I mean, who does the work, the associate? <laughs> I like that. It's true. It's true. But I think he won cases with me, but also with many, 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 many other people. So it wasn't me. Perhaps on a more broader perspective, since you've being in the field for so long, what does make a partnership work between an associate and a partner? Because sometimes it just doesn't work, but sometimes it works so well. Right. Very important question. The answer is don't be a substitute. Be complementary. What does that mean? If you work for somebody, let's say a partner, the fundamental error is to think that you should be the partner. The error is to say, I'll emulate the partner in the way the partner thinks, the way the partner talks, the way the partner behaves. A lot of associates do that. It doesn't even have to be in a law firm context. A lot of people try to be like their boss. That's not going to work. You're supposed to complement your boss. You're supposed to be the other piece in the jigsaw puzzle. If your boss is very big picture, then you should be details. If your boss is very passionate and fiery, you should be calm and cool. It'd be terrible if both of you are calm and cool all the time, just as it's terrible if both of you are fiery all the time. So you have to compliment your boss. I think that works in a work environment, but it also works in a human relationship. The way people pair up, sometimes they think, oh, you know, you have the same hobbies, you have the same personality traits, blah, 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 blah. So you should get along. But that's not how it works. You have to be the other piece of the jigsaw. I want to talk about the art of persuasion, which you've also talked about quite a lot. Was there a particular incident where you successfully persuaded and you're really proud of doing it? Oh, no, I'm not going to talk about my successes because I don't want to be one of those lawyers who talks about, you know, I won this case when I did this. And I remember that another case where I argued this and, you know, it's total flawless victory. But I can talk about persuading people. The thing about persuading people is to be as simple and direct as possible. That's pretty obvious, right? No, many people don't understand what it is to be simple. It comes from understanding what the issue is and how to simplify it. To be as direct as possible means not to use any words that hide your feelings, not to be indirect, but to be as blunt, as clear as possible. I always tell my team of lawyers that you must write and talk as if you're talking to your six-year-old nephew or a small dog. It doesn't matter if you're writing to a judge or to your client. You must talk in a very simple way. That's the key to persuasion. And that's the key to good writing as well. Just keep it short and simple. And so tell me like I'm five. That's basically the rule. Yes, exactly. So when we do this, we all know this principle, but what we need is a good editor. What we need is another person to read our stuff. So whatever you write or whatever I write, I have to show it to somebody else. Let's say I'm writing a legal submission. I have to show it to somebody else in my team. Sometimes I pick the most junior person, our trainee, for example, and say, hey, what do you think? I need that trainee who may not even have read all the other papers to get the gist of what I'm saying. Also, don't be proud. The idea is that when you're writing something, you need to be as open to correction as possible. So don't be so precious about your writing, this word or this phrase or this idea. Because if your reader doesn't get it, then who are you writing for? Perhaps so, an Asian thing. Juniors tend to be very scared of criticizing or be seen to be criticizing their seniors. Is there something yes. that you do to try and encourage this sort of feedback from your juniors? 
Wow, it's really a cultural thing. I myself am guilty of it too. Let's say the Chief Justice is here and I have his judgment here and I don't agree with it. I'll still find it very hard to say, Chief, this part is completely wrong. What are you thinking? I don't think I'll ever say that. If I disagree with someone who is much more of an authority figure than me, I try not to write about the law where I disagree with, with judges because if there's a judgment on something, then that's the official ruling. I'm not going to write about why it's wrong. But I'm happy to criticize politicians or uh, entrepreneurs, tycoons, basically anybody else. But for judgments, I feel that it's not right. Fair enough. Before we go to all your writing, I want to talk about this brief period you had when you were general counsel after oh. one decade of litigation. Why would you do that? We had an IT client. After the case was over, he said he was looking for a general counsel. And this was in, I think, year 2000, the dot-com era. And 2002. Yes, saying that there would be a boom and I wanted to be part of that boom. Maybe I'd be very rich. Who knows, right? He said he would take his company IPO. So I asked the partners and they were very nice. They said, okay, off you go. You be an in-house counsel for a while. And if you come back, come look us up. So I spent two years as the general counsel of Crimson Logic, which is a government IT company. That's a company that provides what we call e-government services. That means basically apps and software that help people use things like the court filing system. In Singapore, we used to file everything by paper in court. But in year 2000, we switched over to something called electronic filing, where we wouldn't use paper anymore. And when I started working in Crimson Logic, I was sent to other countries because one of the things Singapore does is that we want to sell our stuff overseas. So I went to Canada, Saudi Arabia, many other countries to sell Singaporean technology. The thing about Singapore is that we have a brand. The Singapore brand, if it's made by the Singapore government, it's reliable, it's trustworthy. We want to sell that system to various countries. But in doing that, I also became an advocate for Singapore. Because when you try and sell an IT system, that's a government system, you are actually selling how reliable the system is. And in this case, how reliable the government is, because the government made the system. So I find myself having to talk about Singapore, how big it is, what its history is, what its culture is. And many people know about Singapore all over the world. I'm not trying to boast, but I guess the people who were interested in our systems had a pretty favorable impression of Singapore, that it was efficient. We tried to sell our systems in other countries as well, which I won't name. Those countries couldn't accept our system because it left no room for corruption. What does that mean? <laughs> it's quite a strange thing, but when you have paper-based systems, sometimes the clerk can go to the person at the registry and say, oh, can you please file this and put it right on top and I'll, I'll pay you something. That is how it works in some countries. But with an electronic system, you can't do that. So in some countries, we actually got feedback from the authorities that this was a problem because the clerks, the registry, etc., they were used to a certain way of doing things. Obviously, you were talking about being at GC, you were flying everywhere. But I have to ask, were you bored? Because during that time, you did a bachelor degree in computer science and psychology. Sounds like you had a lot of free time. <laughs> it was so awful. It was really awful. I liked the company. I liked the people. But I didn't like the job. It was such a boring job. There was lots of contracts to do. I would be flying around the world, meeting people. So that part's interesting. But ultimately, it wasn't what I was built to do. So in your words, it wasn't my why. I don't exist to be a person selling technology. So when I was there, I thought, since I'm in an IT company, I can spend some of my time usefully by doing a degree in computer science. So I spent my days working and my nights and weekends doing a computer science course, going for tutorials and doing exams, stuff like that. But after a couple of years, I just gave up and I told my boss, I'm so sorry, but I don't like this. So I need to go back and be a litigator. Despite the lack of work-life balance, you ended up becoming president. You still are actually president of Singapore Law Society. When did you become aware of the importance in being involved in the law society? 
I've been in the Law Society in Council for many years. So I think it's important for lawyers to be part of their legal community. In Singapore, there are only 6,000 lawyers for a population of about 6 million. I think there are too few of us. But the upside is that we're a small family. I'm sure it's the same in, in most cities, KL, JB maybe. Yeah, you know everybody. Then if we know everybody and we meet everybody at work, then we should also do the next thing, which is try and solve the problems that our profession faces. We have problems in Singapore. One of them is the attrition rate of young lawyers, which means that during COVID, during the lockdown and immediately after, people were re-evaluating their working lives and they were thinking that maybe legal practice is not for them, particularly the way legal practice has been done in the past. You talk about work-life balance. That's actually such a big issue. It's very interesting. The idea of a work-life balance is something I argue is very new. In fact, the idea of working and retiring is also very new. When people talk about having a work-life balance or working and then retiring, it's not how the human race has been going on. When we were an agrarian society or even when we were an industrialized society, we basically worked for as long as we could because we needed to provide for ourselves. We didn't think there was anything wrong with it. In the same way, I don't understand what work-life balance is. I know that there is work and I know there's other stuff that I want to do. But all that work, my hobbies, my friends, it's all part of life. I don't balance life against something else. So these are all big issues that our profession faces. And this year, when I became president, I thought we will have to talk about the big issues. Even if we don't have solutions, we should start talking. What are we talking about? First, working conditions, young lawyers, old lawyers, working remotely, using technology. We talk about bullying and harassment. We talk about whether we're paid enough by the courts. And that's a whole different area. It's talking about costs. We're talking about changes to the profession. And we're talking about people who are not lawyers coming in to do lawyer stuff. You're talking about social media too. You want lawyers to yes. go on social media. Yes, because as a civic society, we cannot do our duty as citizens if we do not understand the rules by which society work. We have to know what laws are, how they are made, what the laws are, the ones that are important, and how to change them. We cannot have access to justice if we don't understand the law. Since the law is so important, how are we going to learn it? Well, for lay people, they learn it from Netflix. They learn it from legal thrillers. Suits. From suits. And it's all very inadequate. It's not their fault. This is what they're given. Law is a really hard thing to learn. So as lawyers, we need to bridge the gap. We need to tell people what the important laws are what the issues are, how laws are made. And we need to do it in a way that will appeal to people and make people want to read. In other words, we have to be legal influencers. We have to use social media and shape our message accordingly. For me as president, that's what I'm trying to do this year. And it's very useful. For example, there was one issue this year, which is about cheating. Some trainee lawyers were caught cheating in their bar exams. The public was very upset, understandably so. In the old days, before social media, I don't know how we would have dealt with it because the public would just be upset, they would talk among themselves, and then we lawyers would just talk among ourselves and say, well, I don't know why the public is upset. They shouldn't be upset. But we would not engage them. And even if we wanted to engage them, the old way would be, I'm going to write a speech and then I'm going to get the reporters to come. Then they might quote some of my speech, but I can't choose what they quote. And hopefully that little bit that they quote is going to change the hearts and minds of the general public. No way, right? That's not going to happen. So thanks to social media, we have a direct access to our constituency. We have a direct way of talking to the general public. Put say, hey guys, you know this thing that you were talking about that was really upsetting you? This is what really happened. Let me tell you what I think. And I was able to talk and say my piece, equally important, I was able to respond to questions. So when you post something on social media, people will ask questions, they'll comment, and I could engage. In the old days before social media, 
You couldn't do that. You just put your statement out into the vacuum of space and hope that it's clear enough. And it's never clear enough. So I think this is the way forward. If we want to be a more engaged society, if we want to change and bring about a better society, the first step is to know the rules. I couldn't agree more. That's why I also like to create and write online as well. What I noticed during my research is that your current writing wasn't always like this. When you first started three years ago, you wrote bland posts because you didn't want to offend people. And then you changed. I think your partner, Stephanie, had something to do with that change. Yes. When I first started writing, social media is a very new thing. I thought maybe my job is just to inform and not to give an opinion. Maybe I should just talk about a situation without expressing a view. And I thought, oh, that's very proper. You know, I think that's the correct way of doing it. But Stephanie Yen Tio, my joint managing partner in TSMP, she said, no, you, you have to be a thought leader which means that you have to point your readers in the right direction. Don't just show them the landscape. Don't just show them the buffet and say, you can eat this, you can eat that, or you can go here, you can go there. That's not a leader. That's just being a maitre d' or a waiter. So I thought, okay, but what if I say something and it makes people upset? So this is me not being confrontational. But she said, so be it. I mean, people are upset because you said what you thought, then that's how life is. It's terrible if they get upset over something you didn't do, but it's okay if people get upset over something that you did and you believe in. So during the lockdown 2020, 21, I began having more of my opinion, but I tried to sugarcoat it sometimes by imagining something. I would say, well, if I were king of Singapore, and I would use that phrase to say, I'm being slightly imaginative and not entirely serious, so please don't take offense. If I was king of Singapore, I would do this. So for example, if we transport foreign workers in backs of lorries and we don't give them adequate safety measures, they'll get hurt. And that would be the end of an opinion and the end of a post. But to go further, I would say, but if I were king of Singapore and make a law that blah, 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 blah. After a while, it took on a life of its own and I began imagining myself to be king of Singapore and punishing people who are very mean to their pets. or Writing from the perspective of a cat. (laughs) Yes, or writing from the perspective of a cat. So the cat symbolizes a couple of things to me. A cat is very much like a lawyer in Singapore in the sense that cats don't really have a master. You can't make them do stuff that they don't want to do and so on. But the other aspect relates to homosexuals in Singapore. In Singapore, we used to have a rule, a law called Section 377A of the Penal Code. That criminalizes male homosexuality. But the catch was that the government said, although such a law existed, they would not enforce it. So on the face of it, we had a law that says if you commit male homosexual acts, you could be punished and you'd go to jail. And it's on our books like any other law. But this law is special. The government said, We won't enforce it, but we won't repeal it either. And that was their position until recently this year. And I thought, oh, this is such a strange situation. I wonder if there are other situations in Singapore where we have rules, but we don't follow them. You know, in Singapore, we are a very law-abiding nation. SOPs everywhere. Uh, Yes, (laughs) yes. Very different from Malaysia, I should say. You're not that different though. Once you come to Malaysia, it all falls away. (laughs) <laughs> yes, and, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, yes, I think that's environmental. So talking about cats in public housing is very similar to the situation under Section 377A. So 80% of Singaporeans live in public housing. And there is a rule that says no cats are allowed in public housing. But yet you see cats everywhere in flats. So there is a rule, it's a very clear rule, and it's not being observed. In fact, it's not being enforced. That made me liken the situation to Section 377A as well. The gist of it is that it's not a desirable situation if you have a rule that you don't want to enforce. I love your writing because your voice really comes out. And I don't know if this is hearsay, but some of the quotes that I loved was you once saying that a contract is like a condom with the right man, you don't need it. (laughs) Or another time where you would say every celebration is like a virus and it's a hose and I'm the hose. And I wonder, you know, 
this is such a unique voice. It's really memorable. Do you ever sometimes stop and think, oh, is it an appropriate situation for me to share this? Because people immediately go, oh, I'm not sure if I would follow or agree with your humor and they would disengage. It's true. I do often get plagued with self-doubt and worry that I've said something that's inappropriate. But I'm now at the point in my life where I can't spend my time worrying about little things like that. I have to express myself. I have to be true to myself. What about for the young lawyers or young professionals? They also want to share their thoughts, but their bigger concern is, I just started my professional career. I'm sure I don't know a lot of things and it will change over time. But the thing about putting it online is it will haunt you for the rest of your life. It will, it will. And I'm thankful I never had social media when I was a young lawyer. I'm quite sure I would have broken some rules or crossed some lines. The thing about young lawyers now is that I encourage them to be on social media. I encourage them to write about law or to write about their work and to express themselves, to reveal themselves to their employers or to their clients. I think it's a good thing. The trick, though, is not to say anything and everything. It's not about you talking. It's about making people pay attention. And that's the difficult part. Because most of us have so much to say. How do we get people to even notice something that we've written or some post that we've put up? We have to find our own hook. And I'm sure young people nowadays, they know social media better than me. So my tip to them is find a way to make people pay attention. I think you're the perfect person to ask because I look at your posts. Every single one for average person is the equivalent of a viral post, even when it's something as simple as a legal case. So what is the secret? How do you get attention? For me, I feel that we always have to tell a story. I have to tell a story. So the rule is you have to be simple and direct. Simple means your language and direct means the point that you're making. The simplest way to communicate is the way that we've been taught as children. It always begins once upon a time. The moment somebody says to you, once upon a time, you have that person's full attention. Oh, I'm going to hear a story. Oh, there's going to be the characteristics of a story, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So don't tell a fake story, just a beginning or just an end. I know when people write on social media, sometimes they are in a hurry to get to their point. My opinion is that's fine and good. But you need the once upon a time. There are many other ways to write. Mine is not the only way. But what I found is that for me, if I want to talk about a case, I start with, this is the person in the case. This is a person who's autistic, or this is a a, a person who's committed a crime, or this is a person who did this thing once upon a time. That's the beginning. You introduce all your characters. And then the middle, you have the conflict or the issue or the crisis. Then you have the resolution at the end. It's not difficult. It's perfectly doable. I would love to wrap up with the fact that you're also going on a very personal journey, finding out about having cancer. What touched me was that you said that you would fight cancer, you would fight cases in court and fight for lawyers as their precedent. The clock runs out. What's behind that drive? Well, I don't have much else to do. No, (laughs) but but seriously, this really comes back to the why, isn't it? Mm. And... If any one of us knew that this is the amount of time we have left, what would we do? My friends, when I told them I had cancer, they said, oh, you must stop working. You must go on a trip, go around the world, see all the sites, eat the most exotic dishes, and so on and so on. That works for them. That is their why. And that's fine. Another person's why may be, I'm going to write my novel. or And that's what you're doing now. Yes, that's another thing. Just too many things. But You just can't stop. (laughs) I guess not. Something will stop me in the end. But having cancer is helpful because it will tell you your why. Straight off, you don't have to worry anymore. You don't have to wonder, am I supposed to do this or am I supposed to do that? When you're told that you have this, you start thinking in terms of, okay, then I better do this and I better do that. You sound like you have almost accepted this. But you also shared that you were very angry and you were working through it. How do you go through those emotions? I am very upset. It's still very new to me. I found out only in March and we're just in October. So I'm still very annoyed that this is happening at this time. 
I wanted 2022 to be about being president of law society and being a lawyer. And this cancer has really interfered with all that. I don't think I will ever accept it. But what I've got now is a plan. And the plan is, all right, so we'll have to deal with this cancer. We have to do all the other stuff that we need to do in case I have less time. That's what I mean by focusing your mind. It's fortunate in a way because it's possible to go through life without knowing your why at all. You may try very hard to search for it and you may live to 100 and still feel that you haven't done the thing that you're supposed to do. Some people even tell me it's irrelevant. They don't think about it. So that's interesting. And I feel yeah. that's valid as well. It sounds pretty harsh, but not everyone has a purpose. And that's fine because if you enjoy your life as it is now, doing what you're doing or not doing anything, that's valid. No one's going to test you or evaluate your own performance. No one really cares how you do in your own life. When it's over, it's over. You're the only person that's going to judge. Very true. You mentioned friends as well, and I'm sure friends care about what you are going through. I wanted to read one quote you gave once. I realize in life you have three friends. You're wealthier than anybody else. So I'm lucky to have three friends. I wonder, even if you don't share the name, who are those three friends? What are the qualities that allow them to be your friends? Oh, I can't tell you who they are. They get very annoyed, but <laughs> they're very different from me. How do you find them? Life kind of throws up friends along the way. And I think in life, you will meet people. Out of the many people that you meet, you might enjoy the company of a few dozen. And among the few dozen, you might happen to be able to have some chemistry with a few, maybe just a handful of them might like you. And if it's three, that's my rule. If you have three good friends, you have more than most people. You're luckier than the wealthiest billionaire. With your three friends, you have people that you can talk to who care about you. You have people who understand you. Actually, all you need is one person who understands you and who cares about you. That's sufficient. So if you have three, you really have more than enough. Ideally, I should just kill two of my friends because they're surplus. I could donate them to the Salvation Army. Adrian, even though I think I know the answer, do you feel like you have found your why? I do feel that I found my why. And I also want to say that a person can have one why or many whys. If I was to encapsulate the whys that I have, it's probably to reach out and communicate with people to help them make this life a little bit better, to provide some understanding. That's my why. And what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? I feel that I don't like the question because I don't believe that there's any point in thinking about what happens after we're gone. My constant test to any situation is two things. So what and who cares? Whether I have a legacy or not, who cares? If I'm gone, the world will carry on and there'll be a lot more stuff to do. We will still occupy ourselves. And I think that's fine. It's not as if I have any power over my legacy. It's not as if I'm Bill Gates and I have billions of dollars that I can build a foundation. I'm just a guy. And for most of us, here and now is more important than the future. What do you think are the most important qualities of a successful person? Oh, I think if people around him feel better because he's there, that's all that matters. And where can people go to contact you, follow you, support, buy your third book when it's out? <laughs> I'm still writing my third book. But in the meantime, I'm on LinkedIn. Do follow me there. I do comment on the stuff I write. And if you disagree, all the better. And is there anything else you'd like to share with that we haven't covered so far? No, not at all. I am very happy that I have a chance to talk about Singapore and Malaysia. It's the one relationship that Singapore has because we don't have any neighbours except Malaysia. So I'm yeah. very happy that we're talking about it. And I'm very happy that it's a feature of today's discussion.